Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sky Observers Hangout. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to start our videos here so you can see us. There we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I am the Director of Public Observing at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. And my name is Adriana, and I am the Astronomy Educator at the Adler. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening for Sky Observers Hangout. Uh, I want to introduce our YouTube chat moderator for tonight. That is Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Thank you for being here. Um, and also in the chat is our astronomer friend, Dr. Geza Gyuk, who we like to call Stargeza because it's too good not to. <laughs> um, if you see a name with a blue wrench next to it in the chat, that's Geza helping us by answering some of your questions and your comments. Awesome. So Sky Observers Hangout is a place for all of us to gather together and nerd out about the sky. And our goal is to give you practical tips and some useful information, some things to look out for in the sky we all share. And if you want to just watch our show, that's perfectly fine. We also would love to see your questions and observations in the chat. So go ahead and use that chat. Please do. Um, and to get it started, let us know. I know some people have already started doing this, and I am glad to see it. Uh, but to get us started, let us know, where are you tuning in from? Uh, tell us in the chat. Yep, we're going to say hi to a few people in just a minute. But while the Adler's doors must remain closed, we are doing our very best to keep our virtual doors open by creating and sharing some out-of-this-world content for you. And if you wouldn't mind, um, we're going to put a link in the chat. Colleen's going to do that for us in just a sec. Um, Use that to pay what you feel comfortable to contribute to our programming. Thank you so much for allowing us to share our universe with you. Yes. And you can also help us get more visibility for our shows by hitting subscribe for the Adler Planetarium's YouTube channel. If you like us, give us a thumbs up too. Uh, so I'm going to take a look here. I'm excited to see folks hanging out with us tonight. I'm going to take a look to see where people are tuning in from. We've got Folks from the Northwest suburbs, folks from Chicago, from Delaware. Hello, Delaware. Uh, Hello, Delaware. <laughs> we got North Carolina, and I saw our very first person. We saw Louie. Hi, Louie. We know you've been joining us for the past few shows, so uh, welcome to one of our super fans out there. So hope you can <laughs> say hi again. So we've got a few more folks, and who else do we have? We've got Jose is here. Hi, Jose. So is Bob from Mokina, Illinois. Hey, we've got some nice Adler. You both. Yeah, Adler Planetarium Telescope volunteers. Hey, guys. Thanks. Anybody for else? Hey, everyone. Uh, and John from Westchester. <laughs> oh, and someone from Texas. Hello, Zach from Texas. And St. Cloud, Minnesota. Hey, guys, we love that you are joining us. Please continue to share with each other in the chat. Say hi to one another. You don't have to just say hi to us. Say hello to each other. Now, now if you have joined us for prior episodes of Sky Observers Hangout, you know we love talking about what's in the sky and how you can make your own observations of it. We've talked about constellations. We've talked about planets and comets. You name it. Today, we're switching gears a little bit. We're talking about tools that will help you uh, see and find those objects. Now, a huge question that we get a lot, um, especially from new observers, is what kind of telescope should I buy? Now, we're absolutely going to help you answer that question, and we're going to do so in our next episode. So in two weeks, um, we're going to talk about types of telescopes. We're going to have some friends join us, 15 telescopes to show you, all sorts of stuff. We're just going to nerd out about telescopes and all that stuff. But something else we also recommend before getting a telescope is getting to know your night sky. Exactly. Um, so a telescope can only help you see cool stuff in the sky if you know what to look for and how to find it. Uh, so where do we recommend starting for that? It is with binoculars, apps, and books. Oh my, yes, there we go. So <laughs> these tools can help you plan a stellar night of observing. Now, books can help you know what to look for. Apps are great for finding those things and confirming or clarifying what you're already looking at. And binoculars can help you see a little bit more than, than what you could with your own eyes. So we're going to walk you through what you need to know about several of those and our recommendations. Um, so let's get started with learning about what there is to see in your sky with books. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you guys in the chat. Have you all used any books to help you learn about space or learn about observing your sky? 
let us know which one's in the chat because we're always looking for good recommendations too. Um, but Michelle, you are a fan of observing books, right? I haven't yeah. used them much myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm definitely a fan of books. I have been since I was a kid. And I still like using actual physical books for, for some uh, really good reasons. Number one, books don't require battery power. I mean, I'm talking the actual paper books. Um, having someone else's sense of what's important in the sky can also be useful. Um, you can get a clear sense of where to start and what to look for. And there is value to the extra reasoning, the explanations and the content that books can provide, especially for folks who are learning for the first time and who want to learn more. Now, I went up and read, uh, I wrote up a full blog post about, um, about books that, that we recommend. It's not a huge list, but um, we are we, we did that so you would have that as a handy reference. And so our chat moderator, Colleen, is going to post the link to that blog post. It just posted today, so this is brand new. Um, so that'll be in the chat in just a sec. So take a look for it and uh, you can click that link and bring that up and you can read about some books that we recommend. Awesome. Could you give us two quick recommendations here tonight for folks that are tuning in? What observing books have you really liked using? Absolutely. I'd be happy to. So we're going to bring those up and there we go. All right. My top two picks. Number one, 365 Starry Nights, an introduction to astronomy for every night of the year. Um, and this is a book by an author by the name of Chet Ramo. This book has been around for something like 40 years. This is an extraordinarily useful book. Very simple. It is simple drawings, simple stuff. Don't expect flash in this book, but it is so useful. Something to look at. 365 days of the year. And the other one is Find the Constellations by H.A. Ray. Now in the blog post, I mentioned, if you're going, H.A. Ray, I know that name. Where do I know that name? Um, so in the blog post, I mentioned where you've actually heard that name from. Um, and so that those are my top two. But in the blog post, you'll see uh, just a few more. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. There awesome. we go. We've so, also got lots of yep. fun recommendations here from... Ooh. I like that John Hampton has recommended The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which will not show you what to see in your sky, but will show you a good time. <laughs> um, we've also got uh, my favorite observing book is The Peterson Guide to the Stars and Planets by Pasachoff. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Jay Pasachoff. I yes. Pasachoff. Thank That's you. That's a good one. Yeah, Jay is, is really, really great about um, amateur astronomy, all that kind of stuff. So kind of getting down the nitty-gritty explaining some of this stuff so yeah look for jay pasikoff it's a really good author hey, um, says, don't says, forget to bring don't your towel really <laughs> we've right. also got one question already that i want to check in with you about michelle sure. uh, what's paul asks what's a good deal on telescopes and binoculars all things considered um so binoculars, we're going to get to in just a second. So hold off. On, we'll hold off on answering that one. But for telescopes, honestly, it kind of depends on how mu how into this you really want to get, how much money you want to spend. Um, do you already know something about the sky? So here's the deal. You often have to know where something is in the sky in order to get the most out of your telescope. Yes, you can align it to the sky. The, the, if you spend enough money on these things, and we're talking like over $1,000, you're going to be able to get some systems that can align themselves. But how do you know when it actually makes it to something you dial up that you're actually looking at the thing you want to see? Um, so that's where knowing the sky can really help. Some of the systems, some of the telescope systems also don't uh, fully, they, they don't fully automatically align. It, it may start off with the first object and it says, okay, you user, pick the next one. And you have, and here's your list of stars you can pick from. Well, you have to know where those stars are. And, and so that is something that it's not quite always as easy as it's made out to be. Again, if you spend enough money, then you can get better and better systems that can do all this for you, but they're not 100% foolproof. So that's the, that's the best advice I can give. It, it truly depends on how much you already know and how much you're willing to learn <laughs> and how much you're willing to spend. But we're going to talk a lot more Alan. about telescopes in two weeks. So we'll have, like I said, we'll have a lot of them to, to show. And, um, 
So we're hoping that our audience is going to come with their ideas as well. So any other questions before we move on? Uh, no questions, but I did get a couple of people mentioning Turn Left at Orion by Guy Consolmagno. Consolmagno, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Brother Guy, he's a great writer. Yeah, Brother Guy is um, the director of the Vatican Observatory. He is a Jesuit brother, and he is a PhD astronomer. He studies meteorites. He has visited the Adler Planetarium several times. We Very hope cool. in we hope in non-pandemic times we hope someday maybe we can get him back. Um, he is such a cool guy and such a great writer. So yes, I recommend anything by Brother Guy. So great point. All right. Okay. Cool. We ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, so we've got the recommendations for books. Like I said, I've got a few more in the blog post, and you guys are sharing some ideas. So feel free to use the chat uh, to share more ideas. Uh, so you know about some books. Now let's talk about binoculars to get a closer look. Now to our audience here watching, have you tried to use binoculars before for observing? Um, what do you think of them? And Adriana, what do you think about using binoculars? OK, so I will admit <laughs> That as a person who started with telescopes, I was not super excited about observing with binoculars at first because I thought to myself, like, I've already got a telescope. It's fine. It's not that exciting. Um, but I've had a dramatic change of heart, and now I love binoculars. It's like one of those rom-coms where they hate each other at first, and then inevitably they fall in love with each other. That's, that's how I feel about binoculars <laughs> now. Okay. Well, that's a really dramatic change. Uh, how did that come about? What changed your mind? Uh, so I tried actually using them. I see Stephen Cosgrove saying they're so much more portable and that is absolutely part of it. Um, I do not have a car. <laughs> I live in the city. I take public transportation. Uh, so having something that's easy to move around was super exciting, but I also was able to see so much more through them than I thought I was going to be able to see. So once I tested them out, I saw I could use them to see features on the moon, uh, craters, darker and lighter areas. The four brightest moons of Jupiter were actually visible with just binoculars, which was surprising to me. Um, I could see star clusters. Some star clusters look even better with binoculars, like the Pleiades, for example. Um, so there is a lot more to see. And now that I am on team binoculars, I know that there's even more to like about them. <laughs> team binoculars. <laughs> um, so like Steve said, they are super portable. It is easy to find stuff in the sky with them instead of uh, using a telescope because binoculars are less zoomed in to a specific chunk of the sky. You're looking at a bigger chunk of the sky with them. Uh, so that makes it easier to find whatever you're looking for. Uh, they're also easier for some folks to see through because you're using both eyes instead of one. Um, I know some people might have difficulty with just using one eye to look through. Um, they're portable and also they're usually cheaper than a telescope. So all of these are reasons to go out and get yourself a pair of binoculars, I think. Those, those are all really good reasons. I saw someone said um, they bought a pair of binoculars to look for Comet Neowise and actually yeah. it was it was a good it was a good binocular object although it looks like erica that uh, if if that if we're going by the name that's in the uh, account there um you might not have been successful finding them but uh, finding the comet but don't despair those binoculars are good for many more things as adriana mentioned yes. um than just the comet so we hope that you'll take those binoculars out at other times and not just um this summer so um so let's talk about choosing your pair of binoculars so you want to get binoculars that are specifically for night sky observing. They tend to be better suited for what you want to do. So um, I'm going to show a picture in just a second. So give me just a sec. Talk amongst yourselves. There we go. No All right. There are two important numbers to pay attention to uh, for your binoculars. Imagine you're, imagine you're looking at a pair of binoculars described as 10 by 50s. Um, here's what that means. And we've got a picture here of Adriana, these are, are the binoculars that you've got um, in your hands. Is that right? The yes, ones you have on your shelf? they are. My yes. favorites, my friends, my pals. Yep. So on, <laughs> on, the, on the part that faces you, you'll see it says 10, the letter X, and 50. Uh, 10 
times 10x is um, also called 10 by. That is the amount of magnification. So those binoculars that she has are going to magnify objects 10 times. 50 refers to the diameter of the lenses in millimeters. So the diameter of the front lenses. So if we turn those around, um, then uh, actually I can stop sharing and Adriana can show those. If you want to grab yours and I'll grab mine. There we go. Yep. So show the front. So show the, yep. This so side. if you take, yep. So if you take those caps off, you can see the diameter of the lens of hers in millimeters is 50 millimeters or five centimeters um, or about two inches. So mine are uh, called eight by forties. And so mine, it actually says that on, um, on the, on the side here. And right now I can't see myself in the in the video, so you'll have to I'll have to trust that I'm actually pointing it in the right direction. So there we go. You are so it says, excellent. Yay! I love when that works out. So um, so it says eight by forty. So mine magnify eight times, and the diameter of the main lenses is forty millimeters. So just under uh, a couple inches. So the where this matters, where the size, where the diameter matters, magnification. You got that. Where that diameter matters is the amount of light. That your binoculars gather. The bigger the lens, the brighter the image. So that's that's how that actually works out. Awesome. So Michelle, here's a question. What kind of binoculars do you usually recommend? I have been using the 10 by 50s, as you guys know, and I've really liked them, um, but this is my first pair, so I don't know what other options there are. Sure. Well, these 8x40s are pretty decent. I recommend anything in the ballpark of 7 to 10 times magnification. I, slight, I like to go a little, little more toward 10 if possible, but if the 7 times magnification is what you got, use them. 30 to 50 millimeters for the diameter, sorry, 35 to 50 millimeters uh, for the diameter of the main lenses, somewhere in that range. You'll see all sorts of combinations of magnification and size. Um, but if you really want to aim toward one, your 10 by 50s um, are, are really good. As a matter of fact, Adriana has a pair of the Adler Planetarium's binoculars. So we get 10 by 50s because we find that's a nice size um, and they're not terribly heavy. They're easy to move around and you can just throw it around your neck and away you go. So um, anyway, that's, that's, what we, uh, that's what we like to look for, all right? Um, any yeah. questions about binoculars? Ooh. Sort of a question, sort of a comment. Yes. Uh, John has always wondered why they called them a pair of binoculars when it is clearly one unit. Ah, because a, there is a, a unit called a monocular or an ocular, and that is the that is one side looking sending light to one eye, and then you've got the other side, the other ocular. So you could say a monocular. If we were to cut these binoculars in half, that is a monocular, and then two of them are binoculars. So two instead of one. You can actually get one. Um, I guess we would call that a telescope. <laughs> so if you want to just cut it in half. Now, the binoculars have a, a series of uh, mirrors and, and other lenses on the inside. They make them um, more compact. If you get an older pair of binoculars, number one, they're probably going to be made more out of metal. <laughs> they're going to be a little heavier, but they might actually be longer and, and, um, and, and, and harder to move around. So anyway, that's a great question. So yeah, a little, uh, a little scientific language there. So any others before we go on? Uh, I think that is all for now. Awesome. I see Zach is going to bin Big Bend National Park in a couple weeks and can't wait to see outer space. Zach, you will have to come back to Sky Observer's Hangout and tell us how that went. Um, so I know we've got in a, in a few weeks uh, past the telescope one, we're going to talk about the wintertime sky. So we would love to hear your observations of the very, very early wintertime sky, you know, the sky that's up later on. So anyway, all right. We've got books and binoculars down. Let's move to our final sky observing tool, and that is Sky Apps. By the way, if you've still got questions about books and binoculars, keep them coming, because we've got what we want to talk about, but we want to talk about what you want to talk about. So keep those questions coming. So Sky Apps, so apps for your phone, 
are really popular these days. And that's a, there's a really good reason. They make finding things in the sky much easier than it's been in the past. And pro tip, we use them too. Um, it is a great resource to have for both beginners and seasoned observers alike. I do not go out observing without my phone because it can help me figure out what is that bright thing that I'm actually seeing in the sky. Now, here's the thing. If you open up your phone's app store, you are going to find dozens of competing sky apps. So which ones are any good? Um, if you've already found one that you love, please share that with all of us in the chat. By the way, we keep saying this about the sharing in the chat. Once we're done with the video, the chat stays with the video. So if someone replays this whole video, they will see your chat comments. And so your chat uh, comments are just as useful of a resource as us uh, talking on the screen. So keep those comments coming. All right. So Adriana, do you have more to say? I do. Uh, <laughs> if you are overwhelmed when you open your app store by all of the options of Sky apps that you can get, do not worry. I was also overwhelmed by that. Uh, but I have taken some time to test out a few myself so that I could share some recommendations for you guys. Uh, so I tested five different iPhone apps because that's the kind of phone that I have. Don't worry if you have Android because some of them are also available for Android. And I also got recommendations from other friends who use Android phones and have tried different Sky apps. Um, so I've tested three that are free for iPhone and two that are at less than $5 to tell you what I think works best. Uh, you might be wondering why less than $5. I genuinely don't think that you need to spend more than $5 on a Sky app unless you are trying to connect the Sky app to your very fancy telescope to do some very fancy stuff. Um, so this stuff is meant to be accessible and under $5 is gonna get you where you need to go. Uh, my favorites ended up being available for Android, like I said. Um, so we've got recommendations for everybody and I'm gonna let Michelle help you all see what I started to learn. Yep, go for it. All right, so my favorite free iPhone app that is also available for Android actually uh, is Starwalk 2. There are multiple versions, but it is the one uh, with app, with ads, sorry, that I tested out. Uh, I tested out also Night Sky for iPhone. I don't know if you guys have tried that one before. Uh, Starwalk 2, the ad version, and Stargazer Plus. These were some of the most popular ones with the most downloads and reviews in the App Store, but I chose Starwalk 2. Um, Here's why it wins. The accuracy was pretty good. I did actually go out and test it to see if it lined up with the stuff that I was seeing in the sky. It worked pretty well. Uh, it was pretty intuitive. It wasn't glitchy. I don't know for anybody who's tried night sky on iPhone. Uh, it turned, it just continued to shut itself down. Michelle is giving me this. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you can see me, but I'm waffling my hand back and forth. So eh, yeah, it wasn't my favorite. Yeah, exactly. Didn't have any kind of glitchy issues with Starwalk 2, though. It also lets you use augmented reality, which is very cool. It will look through your tele, uh, sorry, your phone's camera, and it will overlay the sky using your phone's camera. So you can actually look at your sky through your phone camera with the stars and constellations overlaid on it. And that'll help you identify what you're actually looking at. I thought that was a super cool feature. You can also dim the stars. Uh, so that might not matter much for you if you are far away from city lights in the middle of nowhere. Um, but for me in Chicago, this is huge because many stars just aren't visible here. <laughs> um, so I want an app to show me the sky as I see it and not with a bunch of extra stars and stuff that I won't even be able to see in my area. Starwalk 2 lets you dim and brighten to adjust to your sky so you can adapt it to whatever you need. It that's also really, has- that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I was a big fan. <laughs> um, it does have, it also has night mode, which, uh, Michelle, can you talk a little bit more about why all of these apps come with a night mode that turns them red? Yeah, that turns sure everything can. you see red. Yes, so the night mode means um, your screen turns red and some of your other apps could offer this as well. Anything uh, sky related will probably have a night mode. And that's because your eyes are less sensitive to red and orange light. And so if you're out in the dark, let's say you're out 20, 30 minutes, your eyes are gonna be fully adjusted to the dark by then. And so if you then turn on your bright, colorful phone screen, you're going to wash your eyes with bright light, especially blue. And that is going, blue light, that is going to 
completely ruin your night vision. And so you won't see as much as you did. You're going to have to wait another 20 or 30 minutes for your eyes to fully adjust to the dark. Now, in our light polluted cities, it's not quite as much of a problem, although it is still a little bit of a problem. If you're out where it's really dark, like Big Bend National Park, um, it is a huge problem. You do not want to waste any single second of your time out there. So turn that screen red and that will keep your night vision because like I said, your eyes aren't quite as sensitive to red and orange light. But one thing you want to also do is turn the brightness of your screen down. Even though mm -hmm. you've got a red screen, you don't want to blast the brightness way up because that actually can, can really mess up your vision as well. So um, temporarily till you get readjusted. So turn the brightness down to something where you can barely see it, but you can still see it. Turn night mode on so that it's red get your eyes adjusted to the dark and then away you go. And so look for something that has that night mode. So, and if it doesn't run away, um, but most <laughs> of these, most of these probably should. Yeah. Most of them do, which I checked for because we are huge fans of night mode um, and red light to keep your eyes dark adjusted. Uh, so a couple downsides, this app does have lots of ads, but that's the nature of getting something for free. <laughs> Um, it's easy enough to close out of them and just keep using the app. Uh, it, it also doesn't include satellite info, but there are other apps specifically for satellite info that are free. And we will talk about one a little bit later. And what and uh, you mean by satellite info, you mean actually watching for satellites in the sky. Yes, exactly. Cool. Telling you where the satellites are going to be positioned in your sky. Starwalk okay. 2 does not do that, but it Got does it. pretty much everything else. So. Um, cool. Let's move on to the ones that cost a little bit of money. All right. So I chose two. I couldn't pick my favorite here because they both are great. Uh, so my favorite under $5 are Sky Safari and Sky Guide, both of which are at $2.99 for iPhone. I believe they have free versions for Android. Um, so Sky Guide is a little bit easier to use, or at least a little bit more intuitive. It comes with a quick and easy tutorial that kind of walks you through. Um, it has similar features to Sky Safari, but it's a little bit less technical. So it has uh, a little bit less settings that you can adjust and it uses a scroller bar um, instead of a scroll bar and numerical magnitude limits for adjusting sky brightness, for example. Um, basically, Sky Safari will let you get a little bit more specific with some of these more technical details, whereas Sky Guide will let you sort of just adjust without thinking too much about the specifics. Um, Sky Guide also gets Adler team member Karen's recommendation. She told us that she thinks it's easy to use. And, and I agree. She, and she's <laughs> in the chat right now. We see you, Karen. And so Hi, yeah, Karen. <laughs> she's out there, she's out there vouching for Sky Guide, definitely. So go ahead. Delightful. Um, but we love them both. That's why I wanted to recommend them both uh, because Sky Safari has a few more technical settings and stuff that I can adjust. I am probably going to leave that one on my phone. Having downloaded a bunch of Sky apps on my phone, I'm probably going to delete them pretty soon. But uh, if I had to choose one to keep, it is Sky Safari. It's pretty great. Um, both of these also do the augmented reality stuff that I was talking about before. Um, they will help you find satellites. Uh, they will do night mode. They have all of the same features, just a little bit more um, and without ads. That's cool. And I see there are so many recommendations flying by in the chat. Great job, guys. Keep that coming. Such a great resource. We're actually going to go back after this show is done um, and, and gather up those recommendations because if we do a show like this again, we're going to take it from your recommendations, not just ours. So keep those coming. All right. Yes. So um, we have a best of list for Android. Now, coincidentally, both and uh, Adrian and I both have iPhone. We just do. Um, but we do have a best of for um, uh, for Android. And so the Android recommendations uh, were Starwalk 2 and Sky Safari are both available for Android. And they have some of the highest ratings in the App Store. Their Android counterparts seem to work well. Um, so we hope you guys have been finding that out, the Android users. and. Um, both of those versions are free. Now, Adler team member Sarah also recommends Heavens Above. 
And she says, quote, I like the extra info it provides about the satellites and how easy it is to toggle dark mode on and off. It shows you what's coming up and can do notifications for satellites. And we've also heard good things about SkyMap from Adler team member Chris. So yeah. um, there, yep. Yeah, so there we've got um, several other uh, recommendations. So I'll leave this up for just a second. So if you want to. Yeah, I can comment too, because uh, we yeah. did get some recommendations from Ken afterwards. Uh, Ken also likes Sky Safari. So we're all on the same page here. Um, but he also recommended Loss of the Night, uh, which he says is a citizen science light pollution app. It really helps to learn stars and constellations while helping with real science. So I was pretty excited about that. Um, and the ISS Spotter, which is an app for iPhone that will just help you with spotting and tracking the ISS if that is what you would like to do. It is free. Um, so if you wanted to get that in combination with one of the other free apps like Starwalk 2, uh, you could still get the feature of looking for satellites without having to spend the $3 if that's not what you're wanting to do. And uh, we hopefully will have Ken or uh, other of our team members on in the future to talk all about light pollution, because that is something that is near and dear to the other planetarium's heart. And yes. our our, uh, our friends and team members are actively involved in researching light pollution, especially in the Chicago area. So we hope to have uh, them on sometime in the future. And if you want to see something like that, hey, let us know. That would be great. Um, all right. So... We've had such great recommendations. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. There we go. Now we recommend these apps. The best thing you can do is try them out for yourself and see what features that you like. So start with the ones we've shared here. If you don't have any on your phone right now, uh, let us know on social media which ones you like best. Um, or if there are other observing tools that you like that we haven't talked about or anything that we missed, please share that with us and the whole Adler community on our social media feeds using the hashtag look up. So all one word, look up. And there are so many great resources out there and we'd love to learn more about them too. This isn't just from us, it is from you. Um, by the way, I have one Sky app on my phone, and that is Sky Safari. So that's the one I love. And if you really want to get deep into it, then they have different levels. So uh, up to and including Pro. And um, you, could, you definitely would spend a lot more money on the Pro version. But if you want lots and lots and lots of info, probably more than you've ever ever would need, then um, Sky Safari is great on, on your phone. So I love that one personally. So any yeah. other questions or comments, Adriana, before we go on? A few. I'm going to call out some of people's uh, other recommendations for Sky apps that they like. I know somebody said Skyview Lite uh, is amazing. We've also got a couple of people vouching for the Stellarium app, which is cool. I believe it is for Android because I could not get it for my phone. Um, I've also seen astrophi Astrospheric for weather and observing conditions, which yes. another, an entire other category of how to get yourself ready for observing is paying attention to the weather. Um, and if, if you've been caught in the rain before on a day that said it was going to be sunny, like we all have, uh, you know that predicting the weather is kind of tricky. Uh, so getting an app or a couple of weather websites that you know are pretty reliable is a great thing to do. So I'm yeah. glad people are recommending uh, Astrospheric. Yeah, I use the um, the desktop version of Astrospheric. So the I'm on my laptop for work, but that's one of the resources we go to and we're trying to figure out if we're gonna in non-pandemic times, if we're going out for scopes in the city, um, that's one of the one of the places we check for the weather because it can give you a halfway reliable sense of what the cloud cover is going to be. And that's something that we're always concerned about is cloud cover. So any others? Yeah, yeah uh, NASA app has a cool, uh, has a few cool features says Erica. Um, we've also got Celestron Sky Portal app is a free version based on Sky Safari, a paid app. That's cool. Didn't know about that. Uh, probably we'll check that out if it's available for iPhone. I'm not sure, John Glover, if that's for iPhone or Android. Um, and we've also got Orbit Track if you are, that's a paid app to show you every satellite in the sky. Very cool. We do have one question too. Oh, John Glover says that it is for iPhone. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, John. Um, and we've got a question from Bruce. What makes a pair of binoculars suitable for the night sky? Ah, well, number one is portability. Um, well, I'm sorry, this isn't in any particular order, but portability um, and also size of those main lenses. Um, and I probably should have given those in, in reverse order, but size of the main lens for gathering light, magnification, 
a little. It's not quite as, as important. Um, but you don't want to go too big. There, there's, there's something to be said for portability. And then if you want to get into astronomical binoculars, that's when you go to something like 12 by 80, 15 by 100. But then you're starting to get into the realm of binoculars that need to be on a tripod. So like a mm. camera tripod. And that is a whole other realm of complication. Um, and so if you want something that is great to start off with, it is making that front lens as big as possible, but not too big and getting some decent magnification, but don't go crazy. Um, we're talking about far away things. If you try to magnify them, they're not gonna appear as big as Hubble photos. So don't worry as much about magnification. Go for something like 10 by 50 or eight by 40 or seven by 35 or something like that. And you will be in great shape for uh, getting to know some of those bigger objects in the sky, the moon, moons of Jupiter, um, star clusters, the Pleiades, the seven sisters looks phenomenal through a pair of binoculars, lousy okay. through a telescope, lousy, so lousy, lousy through a telescope. Yes, because it's too big. And so um, if you want to get into photography, that is something else. But Binoculars are definitely the way to go for some of those uh, more extensive objects in the sky. Yeah, uh, we've got Karen asking, can you see Saturn's rings, which I assume means can you see Saturn's rings through binoculars? I was not able to, but I wonder if that's just me or if that's just binoculars. <laughs> You might need just a little bit more magnification. Um, Galileo's telescope that he had he had improved um, uh, design of a telescope uh, up to about 20 times magnification. Um, that's a little more of a sweet spot in terms of seeing Saturn's rings. If yeah. you look at Saturn and maybe 10 times magnification, you might see that Saturn has ears but you might not be able to distinguish them as an actual ring. That's, that's something that we may have to let that one go and leave that for the realm of the telescope. Um, but definitely Jupiter's moons, absolutely. Um, and yeah. the planets will look like teeny tiny little disks, um, but Saturn's rings probably wanna, wanna maybe uh, leave that one for, for something bigger. Yeah, we've also got, uh, can you take astrophotography pictures through binoculars if you have a mount? It would be hard. I would guess the only thing that you could maybe do it with is the moon. The problem is it, when you start zooming in on something, then you're looking at a smaller piece of sky and whatever you're going to look at is going to zip out of the field of view. And so you can try. And if you succeed, let us know. Um, so if you if you take a picture through your binoculars, let us know. Send us the picture. Um, but if you put your binoculars onto a camera tripod and then point them at something, the sky is going to continue to appear to move. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to like, I'll, I'll try to do this. You have to like get your phone lens lined up with your one of your binoculars lenses and by the time you do that whatever you were looking at is probably going to be gone so you can try i, I don't want to discourage you but i yeah. want to make sure to temper expectations <laughs> yeah it's a little bit tricky um yeah. but maybe possible maybe with something like the moon uh we do have oh wait stephen cosgrove says you need three hands or a friend to take pictures through binoculars yeah there you go. i agree i feel like there's just not there's too much going on for one person <laughs> right right steve's right team effort so uh yeah. get get someone else to help you so that's a that's a great suggestion right um we've also got binoculars and glasses tips uh, mm. We actually do have a response in the comments. John Glover says, if you wear glasses, get binoculars with as much eye relief as you can. If you are only near or farsighted, you can use binoculars without your glasses just to adjust the focus for your eyes. Yes, true. The same thing happens with telescopes. Um, you can take off your glasses, put them to your face, and just adjust uh, the focus for your eyes on binoculars or telescopes. I personally leave my glasses on because I can see better that way, and it works just fine for me. Um, but I know some people prefer to remove their glasses and just mess with the focus. 
Yep. And one thing that also helps is these are not just for show. These little rubber eye cups that are on the binoculars um, are, are also there to, to help get your eye in the right spot. So I tend to leave my glasses on as well. Um, and mainly because if I'm passing binoculars from one person to the next, then it helps to keep the eye schmutz on, on the outside of your glasses and not on your eyeballs. So, um, but yeah, all you have to do is get your eyes in the, in the right spot and um, you can then adjust the binoculars for the diet for the distance between your eyes and then adjust the focus and you're good to go. So basically what you want to do is make your image to be a circle. So every time in the movies, when they show the double lobed view through the binoculars, it's only so they can say, this is through binoculars. You want an actual circle view. You don't want a double lobed view. You're gonna be out of out of focus. You're gonna have your you're gonna have two images if you do that. So see, they don't always get it right in the movies. It's anyway. <laughs> a great point. Uh, all right, so I don't see any burning questions. So we're gonna move on uh, for now, but keep putting your questions in there and we will keep answering them as they come up. Uh, so we've talked about books, we've talked about apps, and we've talked about binoculars. What now? <laughs> um, we are firm believers in the idea that you do not need special tools to look up. The easiest and quickest way to do it is to just go outside and see what you find. But for those who want to go a little bit deeper, try one of these options that we've talked about today and see how it goes for you. So we're gonna give you guys options for challenges that you can uh, do to go outside and start looking up. You can take one of the sky apps that we talked about tonight and take it outside, use it to identify a constellation or a planet in your sky that you haven't identified before. Most of the sky apps will also give you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about that object. Uh, so try that. You can also check out an observing book from your library uh, or go ahead and buy one of the ones that we mentioned to learn more about other things in the sky that you can see during the fall season and then go outside and try and find it. Yep, and I've got find the constellations right here just to show that I'm not just I'm walking the I'm walking the walk not just talking it <laughs> so this is it's a great book it's um uh it it's it's well written it's clear and it looks like it's for little kids but it's really not it's for little kids and their adults um so everyone can get something out of it but I just love the fact that it's digestible and um so just a great book all around and like I said in the blog post I mentioned um earlier so if you missed that part of the show we have several recommendations for books so I'm going to ask Colleen if she can throw the the link to the blog post into the chat one more time so you can get more of our books recommendations and something else I saw in the chat was the little rubber eye cups can roll down in binoculars. And yes, you can do that. Um, so you can, depending on what you need for your glasses or for your eyes, you may need to roll those down. Pro tip, don't leave them down. Because if you leave them down for too long of a period of time, the rubber gets brittle and these things will break off. So be careful with that. Just make sure you undo them um, so that you will have your rubber eye cups actually for longer periods of time. You'll see eyepieces for telescopes come with these things too. Um, so just- They do. Just, yeah, there you go. Can confirm. There you go. And, and you can roll these back too. They do the same thing. Yep, absolutely. And um, just remember to unroll it and, um, but use it if you need to, uh, to be able to get your eye in the right spot. Like I said, I usually need to keep them up and Steve mm -hmm. and others need to roll theirs down. So whatever you need to do, there's, there's some flexibility there. So, all right. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions or comments before we end for tonight? I think that's all I see. All right. Um, but I would love to hear from you guys. So tell us in the chat, which of these tools do you think that you might try next time you go and observe the sky? And you can share with us on social media about what you learned or what you tried using the hashtag lookup. Awesome. And thank you so much, everyone. This was uh, an even better show because you were all a part of it. It isn't just us talking, it's you talking with us and talking with each other and sharing our collective knowledge about how to observe the sky, what to observe, how to do it, tools to use. It's been a lot of fun. So um, I think we've uh, answered our last minute questions here. This is really, really great. So Adriana, you want to take us out? Yeah. 
Uh, again, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope that you'll try some of these tools out. Oh, we, wait, we do have uh, one last minute question for Michelle. Yeah, Michelle, are that. those CDs? <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> Hang on. Um, yeah. So if you haven't been able to tell, we're doing these shows from home. And so um, uh, while the Adler's closed, yeah, so I, I moved my, uh, my, my screen here. So I'll, I'll move back. I think I can move away. So yes, you see some of our telescopes, some of the Adler's telescopes. Got another one behind me to my uh, back to my right here. But yes, those are CDs. We will not get rid of the CDs because if anything ever happens to all the all the uh, songs on the hard drive, we have the backup. <laughs> so there you go. Sorry, that had nothing to do with anything except there's some cool stuff in there. And it looks like Becky said, uh, Michelle, it looks like my CD collection. Becky, you and kindred spirits, hon. We we're, we got to meet someday. So, uh, Paul, you're absolutely right. Rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's he's well represented up on the up on the CD wall here. So, anyway, that was a, <laughs> that was a great uh, <laughs> a wonderful a great tangent. Non non uh, science question. So, anyway, yeah, it's about 2,500 wow. CDs up there. So, anyway. Wild. Uh, all right, friends. So our next show is on Monday, November 9th at 7 p.m. Central Time. And we would love to see you guys there. We'll be helping you answer the age-old question, how do you choose a telescope to buy? Um, so if you've got tips for choosing a new telescope that can help beginners out, share them via our social media feeds at Adler Planet on Twitter and Instagram, Adler Planetarium on Facebook, and please use the hashtag lookup so our other friends can find that information. We would love to feature you and your recommendations in the show. Uh, on Monday, November 9th again, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. By the way, uh, Bruce, Allison, I gotcha. He says I need some vinyl. Oh, Bruce, I gotcha. It's not a lot of vinyl, but it's over here. So I just didn't <laughs> turn the computer far enough for you to see it. Dude, I gotcha. We're, we're good. We just got some, uh, we just got some new vinyl uh, about a week ago. So um, anyway, nope, we're still, we're still good on the vinyl. So Adriana can, <laughs> Adriana can concur. So there we go. Yep. Don't forget to like the video and let us know how did we do? Um, Colleen is going to put a link to our feedback survey. It just takes a few clicks to fill it out. Easy peasy. Um, just a, just a minute or so. If you wouldn't mind, it will help us make our shows even better. Um, you can put ideas for topics that you want to see in future shows. We haven't set our schedule for January through June yet. So this is your chance to tell us what you want to know about. Um, so we're going to uh, put that in the chat. There it is. And um, so uh, click that link, have it open. And when we close out for today, just go there. And it's also in the description for the show. So um, if you don't find it in the chat, you can find it there. Thank you so much, everyone. This was super, super a lot of fun. Um, thank you for joining us. Please keep looking up. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks a lot. Have a great night. <laughs>